In episode 12 of Green Pill Weekly, we review Donnie Green's video on Heavy Duty Trays. What the? Andy. Ricky shares the four things she couldn't do without in the garden. And this time with pants, Andy propagates bushes in the winter. So a couple of years, this handsome cat came across our radar, and at the time, it was known as Finest Foods New York, and uh, that business is still going, it's still thriving, but most of you better know him as Donnie Greens, ladies and gentlemen, my friend Don, who we got to meet a couple of years ago at New York Ag Tech Week, back whenever people could meet up and travel and all the stuff that we all miss so much. But uh, every Tuesday, Donnie comes out with a new, uh, very informative microgreens uh, business, microgreens grow a video, and just general how to be a badass in the in in agricultural industry. So I really want you to check him out. And last week, he did a video about selecting the right, uh, i.e. durable microgreen tray for your business. Uh, didn't endorse anybody on this, but uh, it's. Uh, I know that he uses our stuff quite a bit, so I love seeing our stuff in operation at such a fine location and by such a nice dude. And uh, as he goes through the, the benefits and the, the cost benefits of purchasing these trays, I just thought I would expand a little bit and um, maybe fill in some gaps that I thought could be filled in based off a lot of phone calls and emails that we get. So here's Donnie. Microgreens trays are a very important piece of equipment for growing microgreens, and it's critical that you buy the right trays. By the end of this video, you're gonna know the exact aspects that make a tray good and which trays you should avoid purchasing. For the best microgreens content on the internet, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell that way you get notified when I come out with new microgreens videos on Tuesdays. When I first started my business four years ago, I ended up buying the wrong trays. They're super low quality. They would crack and break. Um, and this ended up causing what I like to call as the tray graveyard. Real quick. So when you first get into business, and I for sure felt this whenever I started my farm, and we see this a lot. I don't know why we all get in such this crazy hurry. Like we, we want to do this, we look into it and we think about it and we think about it. And then we finally decide to pull the trigger and it's like everything, you're constantly feeling behind on everything because everything is so new. Uh, one of the things I suggest to everybody is just wait a minute and just make sure that you're buying the right stuff. Like people call us, they wanna order right now and they're, they're, so, they're so sure. And it's always a, a pretty clear indication that when somebody calls us, and look, I was so, so guilty of this. I've got more shit in my shed right now, just like this tray graveyard because he bought the wrong trays. I bought so much of the wrong stuff, and it I've been carrying it around with me ever since. Like I move, it's like I won't get rid of it because I spent money on it, right? But it's just this constant thing I've had to deal with because I pulled the trigger too fast. I didn't look at other vendors. I was so sure in what I was doing. Uh, I would have been greatly benefited at pausing. And same thing nowadays. I can almost hear myself on the other end of the phone whenever we're talking to folks. They want to buy, 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 buy. Right now, everything's in a hurry. Can I get rushed? To it? Just wait a minute. I mean, nobody's going anywhere. The season isn't going to be flushed down the toilet if you wait a couple of days. Just I really suggest that you just wait just a minute. Talk to one more person. Call one more vendor. Um, I can say that because I'm so confident in Bootstrap's ability to outperform uh, both in customer service and in the trays, but I would rather you know for a fact that you did your own due diligence and decided that we were the best on our own merits other than get a quick sale. So just wait a minute and just do yourself a favor there. It's worth it. Um, and this ended up causing what I like to call as the tray graveyard. Um, not only is this a waste of money, but there's a lot of other problems with these trays as well. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you exactly what makes a tray good, what makes a tray bad, and why you should be buying the right equipment for your microgreens business from the start. There are two main factors that make a microgreens tray good for growing microgreens. Um, so first let's start out talking about like the shape and more specifically the depth or the height of the tray. He's, he's talking about the size of it, first of all, and, and he does mean the depth, but we do get these inquiries from time to time where uh, we're trying to reinvent the wheel 
and somebody either wants this huge tray, like a three foot by four foot, like it happens all the time, but it's, I mean, it's one of those things where we as a company have to vet, is there an actual market fit here or is somebody just, uh, are they a beginner and they think that this is what they want other than industry standard kind of things. And when we refer to industry standard, it's like, we know that this thing works. We know that these trays fit within each other. We know that chefs like to buy in this usable quantity. Like a chef doesn't want to buy like a huge tray if they're going to do like cuts. That's why we have the 1020, the 1010, the 5x5. Five five. We have all these different sizes and configuration that, look, if you go to a chef and you're trying to sell live cut, fresh cut, whether that's a garnish or an herb or microgreen or what have you, you want to sell them in something where you're going back the next week or your next sales cycle, not them buying in bulk. Now, if you if you need bulk, there's other ways to do that, but just think about there's a reason these things are the size that they are. There's a reason that they're the depth that they are, which is he's fixing again too. So before you try to do uh, something that isn't out there for a very good reason, like if there is a reason, you'd be able to find it, but there's just not, so. There are basically two main options in terms of depth of trays. Uh, the first one is your deep tray. They're usually around two and a half inches deep. And then the other version is your shallow tray, which are typically about an inch and a quarter deep. You want to buy the shallow trays for a few reasons. First, um, because they're shallower, there's less volume in there. You're gonna be able to use less soil to grow your crops, which is gonna save you money in the long run. I love that point. It's this weird psychological thing that if you have a deep tray, you're you're gonna use more more soil. Period. I don't if you, even if you measure it out, it's gonna look shallow. And it's as you're gonna come to find out here in a second, there's just no need for it. You need such a thin layer of substrate to grow these microgreens that having that shallow tray is just a perfect amount at the bottom. And I, I love what he's fixing to get into next. The second is that because they're a lower profile, they take up less space in your farm. So they are easier to store and you could also fit more of those trays onto your super racks. So the storage is so overlooked whenever you're starting a farm and whether that's outside, whether that's inside, no matter what type of farm you go to, uh, the folks that we talk to is it, it, storage is always an issue. You, you never account for Hey, we have to store. We have to buy media in bulk, whether that's uh, rock wool or uh, these uh, soil mixes, like he's doing. If you buy it a bag at a time or a box at a time, it's ridiculously expensive. So the ability to buy a pallet and having it stored is one is is one thing. But if you don't have room because you have all these extra trays, and let me tell you something, man, going into the Bootstrap Farmer warehouse and going to where we keep the deep trays versus where we keep the shallow trays. Uh, picking up a box, uh, the weight difference is pretty substantial. So because he's able to get so many more trays and IE plots of uh, production within a smaller area, he's able to save on that storage space that I guarantee you he's going to need uh, for other reasons. You're also going to get better airflow with the shallow trays across the base of the plants, which is often where the mold and the fungus problems happen. So that is probably my favorite aspect of the shallow trays is that you're getting more airflow. So check out his fans right here. And when he's talking about that airflow, uh, I don't know what I'm pointing at. I hope you guys can see it. But whenever he's talking about that airflow coming right at the base of where that soil is versus where those shoots are popping up or where the stems are popping up and that nice thin layer of, of air versus if my hand represented a deep tray and this was the soil about halfway through, you, you have this pocket of dead air space where when the fan hits the side of the tray, it's not gonna go anywhere. And then you have that dark, damp breeding ground for some of these mold and fungus problems that is so prevalent. Uh, and here in a second, he's gonna talk about another reason uh, why that could happen. But the airflow issue, man, it's huge. It keeps the gnats away, it keeps the fungus away. And uh, I guess the, the better way to say it is the stems have more access to the available air movement. Is that you're getting more airflow across the base of the plants. Another great benefit is that when it comes time to harvest your microgreens, you're going to be able to get closer to the base of the plant. So not only are your yields going to be higher, but it's going to be a lot easier and faster to harvest 
because you don't have to like get into that deep tray and try and harvest down below. Um, the base of the plants are right at the same level of your tray, so you can just harvest right there and they're ready to go. I can't say it enough. I mean, he, he nailed it on the head. It's faster, it's that, that time. The money you spend on a shallow tray or a specialty tray or a durable tray, it's gonna, it's gonna save you that time. And because he can get that full yield, if you're selling by weight or if your chef is requesting longer stems, whatever the case may be, having the ability to harvest at the level that you need to without having to dig around in the corners. And if you haven't done it, before, if you haven't done it before, it, it's a significant difference. Now, also, if I'm getting real technical here, the shorter trays are harder to break because when you're holding the edge of that tray, because the tray height is shorter, it's less leverage that you're essentially putting on the tray, causing it to break. The deeper trays, because of that height is higher, you're able to get more leverage with your thumb, um, improving your chances of breaking the trays. I totally hear what you're saying there, Donnie. Uh, and I, I know that on that um, example that you just gave, uh, he basically, he didn't use our trays because there's so, there too much flex, but I'll put our, I'll, I will put our deep trays up against the same uh, kind of abuse that our smaller trays can handle. But if you're not using bootstrap farmer trays, what he said about the leverage is spot on. So just something to look out for if you don't happen to choose us. We still love you. Let's talk about the second factor that makes a tray great for growing microgreens. Comment below and let me know if you are using the deep trays. I started with the deep trays. I wish I hadn't. The shallow trays are much better. But if you are using deep trays, let me know in the comments below and let me know your experiences with them. The second factor for microgreens trays is essentially their durability or their strength. You want a tray that is super strong and will essentially never break on you. Why would you ever want to keep buying something over and over and over again, just spending more money when you can just buy something in the first place that's going to last you forever. You only have to buy it once. You can keep on reusing it, keep on growing, keep on making money with it. Um, even if the price is maybe two or three times the cost of the cheaper trays, you're going to have it forever. It's, it's very much more of an asset than an ongoing cost for your business. I love the way he categorizes these trays as an asset. So keep in mind that any tool that you buy for your business, whether that's a camera, a computer, a tray, a truck, uh, these racks, everything is going to have a lifespan of use. Um, everything is going to have um, like you can set it up as a deduction. This is a CPA talk. Don't listen to me for CPA advice, but if my CPA were here. He would say, look, if you bought these trays, they're going to be good for X amount of years. And then we're going to either take the full expense now or depreciate them out. I mean, with trays, you're going to take the expense with a truck or a big system or something like that. You would depreciate it. I'm getting way off topic. I apologize. But just the fact that he's thinking about this as an asset instead of a liability or a cost is, is pretty cool because that means that he knows by spending twice as much or whatever, whatever it is, depending on how many buy, uh, the more you get, the cheaper it is, which is contradictory to what I said earlier about not buying everything at once. But there's a sweet spot in there for everybody. But these trays will absolutely pay for themselves after a harvest or two. That tray has paid for itself. So if you look at the exponential growth, uh, Nick and Nathan of On the Acre talked about exponential growth in their microgreens class, which is on the Urban Farm Academy. It's absolutely for free. Uh, you can go check that out. But they basically say, look, start out with a rack. That single rack, you dial it in it's much easier to learn everything once. And then you can double the size of that. And then you learn to kind of make the micro adjustments that part to, to service that rack, to water that rack, to plant it all out, to harvest it. And you kind of get used to that. And then you can double that size again. So you go from one to two, from two to four to four to eight. And because you're just letting these assets pay for the next round, you're not out of that out of pocket expense in an ideal situation. And that's what you should be uh, aiming for is an ideal situation. So again, this is an asset, it's not a liability. Right, you wanna be investing in an asset that will make you money year after year, 
rather than incurring an unnecessary cost over and over again. You don't need to be paying that cost. Additionally, it's gonna be harder to grow high quality greens in the cheaper trays because they actually sag down in the very center of the tray. Uh, so what's gonna happen there is you're gonna get more water absorbing up into the soil in that center of the tray, which is more of a problem point in the first place. So your crops in the middle are gonna be more wet, more prone to damping off, um, you're gonna have a lesser quality if they're wet because they're gonna have a shorter shelf life. And then also you're gonna be getting less water around the edges because the middle is gonna suck it up first, which is also increasing your chance of dehydration around the edges of that tray. Watering, in my opinion, is probably the most difficult and challenging skill to learn as a microgreens farmer. So you might as well just make your life a little easier and buy the good trays from the beginning. Now you know what makes a good tray and a bad tray and what tray works best for microgreens, but what if you wanna know about the other supplies and equipment that's needed to start your business um, and to even just grow your business? In all my YouTube videos, including this one, I always put links in the description of the video so you can have easy access and see exactly what I'm using. All you have to do is simply scroll down to the bottom of the video Hit see more and you'll see links for almost all the seeds and supplies and equipment that I use here in my business. If you wanna see a whole video I made specifically on the supplies and equipment needed for your business, click this video or click the other video to learn exactly where to buy the best trays so you don't get stuck with the bad ones. If you like this video, be sure to hit that like button below, uh, subscribe to my channel and share this video with anybody you think it may help. Thanks again and I'll see you next time. So man, that was a great video by Donnie. And again, all of his videos are great. I do suggest you subscribe to his channel and take a look at, take a look at some of those too. Uh, you know, and at the end of the day, purchasing any equipment, no matter where you're at in life, whatever small business you happen to be in, uh, taking your time, finding the right vendor fit, uh, finding something that matches your budget without going too far over. And just, I, I think it's, less budget and more about what's right for the job and the the uh, the shallower trays the more rugged trays fit well for uh, Donnie he's been able to find a way for them to pay for themselves and to consider it an investment and that's the most we could hope for so thank you Donnie for uh, letting us review your channel we don't do anything without asking folks first and uh, he's a good friend of ours and I just appreciate it if you check him out all right Today, for just a tip, we're gonna to talk about our RO filters here. Um, when we buy our RO filters, they come with this nifty little wrench here, right? Um, they break, they get thrown away. Let's face it, they're pretty small and they're plastic. We forget where they are. The filter can only last for so long, it's inevitable we're gonna to need to change that thing. And the problem is, this ain't gonna cut it. This is what most of us have in our toolboxes, your standard pliers, channel locks is what I prefer for this tip here. You could use an oil filter wrench or something like that, but gosh, to get one that big, you're gonna spend a lot of money. What if we could use that concept, something we have with us in the greenhouse right now? Well, one of my favorite tricks here is to take your belt. Any belt will work. Use a leather belt, this is a little, what is that, that, that fake nylon paramilitary, uh, or the paracord type of, it doesn't matter. And the channel locks. This also will work with your standard uh, pair of pliers, but the channel locks are gonna be a little more comfortable in the long run. So, you don't wanna run into town, you gotta change that filter. You wrap it around, now we add our channel locks to that situation. Now, that's the thing, you gotta think about it. I do this backwards every time. So you want to come at it, right? And now we're going to roll it. And this is tightening, same concept as that strap wrench. Oh, I've got pressure to this. All right, folks. <laughs> Everybody makes mistakes. There we go. Get our pressure down. So that should have probably been our tip, safety first, right? All right, we're getting her down, down. There you go. Simple as that. Not bad. Save yourself a trip to town. Works on oil filters and fuel filters too. Hey guys, today I wanted to talk about my four favorite tools, resources for the garden. Now, 
a lot of these things are new discoveries for me or are items that people look at and they're like, what would you use that for? So I wanted to talk about my four favorites today. The first one I want to talk about is this hand pump sprayer. Look at this beautiful thing. It was $7. I'm so mad. Nobody told me about these hand pump sprayers before. So I would bottom water my seedlings and I would do, you know, foliar sprays on them with just like your regular misting, like um, hand sprayer. But there was just not like the mist was a straight shot. Like you guys know the spray that comes out of a nozzle can make or break your relationship with that product. Now the sprayer on this is incredible. You can adjust it. So as you can see here, there's a little nozzle and you can twist it for different um, like widths of spray. So you could do a complete jet stream or you could do uh, something a little bit less aggressive. Let me find one, let's see, that's a jet spray. So let me show you guys here. So that's the nozzle. So there's that. You could do, look at that. Look how, look how beautiful that is. So to just mist your seedlings, do really gentle foliar sprays, like this has changed my life. For $7, this has changed my life. And I'm so mad that I don't know what, where I've been, but I've never seen these before. No one's ever told me about them. And I posted about these on Instagram and I had a bunch of people DM me and they were like, what, where do I get one of those? So clearly I wasn't the only one, but this just makes watering your seedlings and doing any kind of a spray, anything on them so much easier. You know, you can get these anywhere, any hardware store, any garden center, you can buy them online. And my favorite part about this is there's a weight on the inside of this nozzle at the bottom. So when you tilt it, you can still spray, which is really nice. It's not something that you get on just your regular run of the mill, like spray bottles that you get at like the dollar store. So $7, they also have them up, at least at the hardware store I saw, um, they had them up to two and a half gallons and you could just hold it and same concept, you pump this pump here until you feel some resistance and then it's, you know, good for a few minutes worth of spraying. So if you buy anything, <laughs> buy this. <laughs> Next is these two and a half inch, or excuse me, these one inch mesh trays from here, Bootstrap Farmer. Now, I love these and I've always loved these. This was actually the very first product I ever bought um, before I started working for Bootstrap. This was the very first thing that I bought and I loved it. This is the item that got me hooked and I it doesn't get ordered very often and people call when I'm talking to people, you guys chat in on the, chat function and people are like, what, what are the mesh trays for? And they're incredible. I use my trays for a multitude of things, but I use my microgreens in here. So I'll use um, whatever media I plan to use. You know, I'll pack it in here and the drainage is really even, as you can see. The holes are really small, but they're consistent throughout the entire tray. So every, inch of the bottom of the tray all the way across is even. And I like that because I, my grow station is in my kitchen. So there's a lot of humidity in my growing space and there isn't always a lot of circulation. I don't have windows in my, in my apartment, shockingly. Um, there's no airflow. So I have to run an oscillating fan and I need things that are really porous that will allow that airflow through. And because there's so much airflow going through, or at least I monitor it. I need to keep them hydrated. So, you know, they kind of go hand in hand, I feel like. And I will also just use these to house my pots or um, I keep them in the two and a half inch plastic pots or I keep my seedlings in like fabric, bio like degradable baggies. And those are extreme, obviously they're, they're sacks. So they're really porous. So having, um, Having something that's even and that it's not going to sit in that stagnant water like in a regular tray that is, you know, flat or even our slotted ones. I love our slotted ones, um, you know, just as much. But these are my favorite because the spacing and the drainage is so much more even. And I, like I said, I use them for so many different things. I also have the two and a half inch deep ones where you can just drop it directly into um, a 1020 without holes or whatever it is, you know, that you're going to bottom water in. And I let my tray sit in there for a few minutes and then I take it out. And because the, you know, the holes are so even, again, with the even and consistent airflow. So 
Next, where is it? Here we go. I probably should have put these on my lap. So next is something that I talked about in a previous video in regards to soil pH. And it is just this cheap, I got this on Amazon, I think for like $9.99 and it's cheap, moist, light and pH reader. Now, I talked about soil pH and the importance of it and how to measure it and all that stuff in a previous video, but this is the tool that I talk about and then how I do it. So I do soil pH tests like constantly. I'm like, I have this, so I don't know, just stick it in there, I don't know. So you could just take this tool and stick it directly into your soil and you just leave it there for a little bit and it'll give you a reading on this meter. And because I am such an, obsessive control freak. I was trying to think about a different way of phrasing that, but because I like to have as much control over my environment as I can, so I can produce just the best quality plants and, and fruit on off of those plants, I really care passionately about the growing environment that my seedlings are in. And like I said, that, you know, that also boils down to the pH level. So if you wanna learn more about pH, we talked about that in a previous video, but for $9, you can pick up at the hardware store, at the garden center, online. Um, I mean, even like seed websites carry these and it really could be a, a handy tool to indicate any you know abnormalities or imbalances that are in your soil that could be easily remedied. So go get you one of those. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about, I don't have any more of, but I'll pop a picture up of it on the screen and it's a root inoculant. Now, root inoculants are powdered. Um, I don't know what the word is. They're, they're powdered. And what you can do, you can use them in three different ways. You can mix it in with your you know existing soil. So let's say you bought a start at the nursery and you're gonna put it in a pot. You can stick your potting mix in there and mix in some root inoculant and then transplant your pot, or excuse me, your plant in there and it'll be more evenly spread out amongst the soil. So it'll be available, but not in such a concentrated environment. So it'll just be accessible over time and continuously feed um, your plant so it develops strong roots. And a strong root system is important because it'll allow your plant to take up you know, nutrients efficiently and it'll have more access to it because it's strong and it's healthy and overall good is good, only good things will come out of it. Now you can also mix it in um, at the point of transplanting. So you can, let's say I have a tomato start and I'm gonna go transplant it into the soil. I can take a little bit, read the, the packet, it'll tell you about how much you're gonna need to use and you'll just sprinkle it into that hole that you dug and then just sprinkle just a very thin layer of soil right back on top of that. And then you'll put stick your transplant on top of that soil and just, you know, obviously get everything situated nice and nice and transplanted. And that'll help because, you know, plants like to stay in one place. As valuable as the seed starting process is and getting a head start on your season, transplanting will inevitably, you know, it might shock your plants I haven't really dealt with transplant shock or anything like that, but it does happen. So when you cultivate an, an environment that's robust with nutrients and, and supplements to help them access that nutrients, it'll only benefit you and your plant and it'll help minimize any potential shock or anything like that that would happen to you know that, that transplant. So those are my four favorite items. Now, these aren't things that I ever you know, was taught about when I first started gardening. These were things that I just kind of stumbled upon that for me and even the most simple ways have really changed the game for me in terms of production or can, you know, uh, organization or per it just, it's, it's done good for me in my gardening career, uh, life here, guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, quick rundown again, two and a half, or excuse me, why do I keep saying two and a half? One inch deep trays, soil pH reader, root inoculant, and a hand pump sprayer. So I'll see you next time, guys. Bye. Hi, we're at our neighbor's farm, Rathvinden. It's a flower farm here in the valley. And uh, we're gonna get into our pack for doing cuttings of the sea buckthorn they have next door here. Now, you don't need to get into anything this fancy, a plastic bag or a beach bag, anything will do just fine. I do a lot of different cuttings and propagating um, and this 
pack actually doubles as a seat. Um, so the first things that we're gonna go over today, in almost all of this, you can get in your kitchen. Um, this is, I believe, some sort of a powdered peanut butter container, plastic, so I don't break it, leave any glass. Simple water bottle with some water. Um, that's just in case you have to cover some ground or, you know, maybe you get thirsty too. Um, this is a salsa container. I brought two containers today because we're actually going to end up taking some cuttings from some Russian olives as well. Um, we planned on just the sea berry, but, I, you know, plan on running into something else. I like press and seal. It works really good for a lot of different reasons here. Um, little tape masking uh, painter tape works really well too and it's cheap in bulk uh, marker pen something like I said today we were gonna take one variety and we end up we're gonna take two so we have to make sure that we know what's what um, you know maybe a pruning knife again probably not necessary something you are gonna need is a good pair of shears or scissors Make sure they're clean and make sure they're sharp. Um, and I'm looking around today, as even an experienced person will do, I forgot. No, I did not. Excuse me. Paper towels, um, clean the, the scissors, the knife. I like paper towels because, um, well, I usually don't because you throw them away, but I do in this instance because we can keep things a lot cleaner. <clears throat> Okay, so with all of our stuff here, we're gonna start up, this was the first tree we talked about getting cuttings from, so I'm gonna take this container here. An inch or so of water, it doesn't have to be a lot. And <clears throat> let's put right on the container. This is a nursery marker. It's a little beyond a permanent marker. Permanent marker would be fine too. Let's do that before we get any plant material involved. Wait, I can't mislabel them. Now, the next part. These trees are, or shrubs, I suppose, depending on who you're talking to. They uh, do a really good job of propagating, even in nature on their own. So I'm not too concerned. Actually, one of the reasons folks kind of went away from these trees is um, you might be able to see the thorns and the fruit attracts birds and can be a mess, but that fruit is very good for you. Um, so this tree has been dormant for a couple months. It's a great winter activity. Talk to your friends, neighbors, you know, you see a tree you like, maybe go knock on their door and see if they wouldn't mind you making more of them. Um, always offer to bring one back. It makes it a lot easier for folks to say yes. All right, so I'm, I'm looking to probably just take three, maybe four today. We'll cut those down into doubles. So here's a water spout here. And we're, she mentioned she had been working with them a little bit. So we're gonna take some here, some there, and we'll see what does best. So this one here you can see is already grown up in the tree. So we might as well help with a little bit pruning. That's gonna have to be done either way. That's a really big one. So let's just come in. Here. It's a great spot. As you see here, I don't know if you can, I, I picked a bud here that is going to send that branch out and fill this gap. So this one here you can see, this is going to cause a lot of rubbing on this main stem. So again, let's pick one that has a really nice shoot that's going to, you know, let's not eliminate the branch. Let's send it in the direction we want. Boy, that's a tough one. I'll go with you. All right. Well, we've got our cuttings here. Let's go back to the greenhouse. All right, we're back at the greenhouse with our cuttings. We have our sea berries here and the Russian olives that we grabbed on the way out. Um, we're gonna take them and put the cuttings into the Bootstrap Farmer 14 inch bags here. Um, I like to use the bags for just about everything and they're great for cuttings because you can save soil, you can plant cuttings, 
you know, depending upon what you're growing and how they're trimmed up top, they can be anywhere from one and a half to three, four inches apart from each other. So you can see this is gonna be a really good use of our space. Now, as you can tell, here's the, here's the standard bag. And what I like to do for cuttings, especially because we are not developed root system yet, is just roll the bag under. It makes a mess, it looks kind of silly at first here. And then pack your dirt accordingly. All right, so now we have two of the bootstrap farmer bags ready for my favorite version of propagation. This is real simple, just an easy potting mix, a lot of perlite. Now what we're going to do is cut our cuttings down. Sea berry here. This little guy here, we might use that. We'll see if that'll be a new top on this tree. All right. There's another one here. The thing with the sea berries is they grow pretty rapidly, so we're going to go pretty small. I messed up there. Try to keep them about three inches away from the outside of the pot. The outside of the pot's going to dry out a lot faster. Be careful of thorns. Any dead or sick pieces, we'll just get rid of those. top of this tree. Looks like it might have got a little wind burn, so we'll just, we'll put that in there. It might not make it, but that's okay. Thorns, if you want to avoid pricks when you're dealing with the bag. Can't always avoid pricks, but here we can. All right, and then Im immediately water them in. Didn't water too heavy, we'll be back. All right, now these Russian olives. This is a favorite of mine. A lot of opinions on Russian olives, mostly, uh, mostly pretty bad opinions. Very hardy tree, very, very, very hardy tree. And again, let's try to make a few. Thorns, thorns aren't always bad. I think, you know, this is a defense. Now, any of this mess can come off. All right. You can see we got some nice big cuttings off of this one. Soft wood. I'm not sure how the dormant soft wood here. This looks to be pretty new. We'll see how that does. Like I said, give yourself at least an inch and a half between everybody here. You will thank yourself when you're peeling them apart from each other. Label. Same deal as before. We're going to water it until we start to have water collecting, then we'll just go back to our other container. Now over the next few weeks, we just need to keep these cuttings moist, not soaking wet, but we can't let them dry out. And with these particular varieties are, are quite drought hardy, so I'm not too concerned with them drying out. Some plants might want a humidity dome on top. Um, now this is, is one of those situations, I offered my neighbor a couple of cuttings back for some cuttings. I'd been admiring some of these trees on her property and you know that's one of those things. In the winter time when we're not really thinking about gardening maybe there's a tree or a shrub in your community that you've been noticing or you know maybe there's somebody out there that has a bunch of trees that you've been eyeing. Go talk to that person. Tell them how much you enjoy their trees and shrubs. Tell them you know hey I want to try my hand at propagating some. Would you mind if I took some Maybe I'll bring you some back if I'm successful. Um, some of those situations, folks might want money or something along those lines. Move on. There's plenty of trees. There's a lot of shrubs out there. There's a lot of people that just want to share the joy of their trees and shrubs with you. Wow, it's sunny. 